was a real back and forth about who would be on this mission, who wouldn't be on this mission. The Dirty Dozen obviously came to mind. Everybody has a good reason to hate everybody else. I mean, it's definitely got that, you know, gathering together these kind of misfits. A bunch of our favorite characters, uh, many of whom have never been on screen together, but who all find themselves at the end of the world for one reason or another. And so getting Tormund back in the picture, the Hound and John and Beric and Jorah, uh, it's a fun group. The sequence had been so well conceived on a visual level by Alan and his team to do that with hundreds of people and weather and visual effects and fire with lots of moving parts and still have that sense of artistry about it. it takes a different level of directing. Our story is seven guys uh, on a rock being attacked by whites and trying to tell a clear story of, you know, your task is to defend a perimeter and as you lose, your perimeter's gonna fall back and fall back, and how do you kind of hold order against just pure chaos? It's, you know, hurting kittens. It's, um, <laughs> you can't see anything except people whacking each other, um, and it takes some effort to talk to the cast to sort of say, no, the story is, here's a line, and we have to show that it's not being broken or that it is being broken. It was important to create a situation where you, I'm hoping the audience will think that one of our beloved characters is gonna die. I mean, we wrote it, and we were watching it, and I was thinking, I was like, holy shit, Tormund's gonna die. But it, it, somehow, he managed to override my rational brain and make me think that Tormund was gonna die. No matter how great your visual effects are or your, your art department and everything, there's just nothing quite like the real thing if you can find it. Iceland exists and it's real and it's cold as hell and it's beautiful and there's just nothing like having that reality on screen. It doesn't look like anywhere else. Half the time, it doesn't even look real, and I worry that people are gonna think the blues of those glaciers are some kind of cheap special effect. The more spectacular looking it is, the more difficult it is to shoot there. I think there's, um, there's a sort of kickbollock scrambleness to filming out here, where you, you, you have such limited daylight, and you have conditions which are like this or, or worse. It just gives it a sense of reality, you know? In the world of Thrones, it's great coming to these landscapes that just really kind of arc back in time and take you to something very, very brutal and barren. There's an extent to which nothing ever surprises you on this job anymore, but this, <laughs> you, this you still can't help but be impressed by this. I mean, it's nuts. You can't get to this location without literally monster jeeps. It's a hell of a way to go to work. The Icelandic uh, technical crew the, for the, setting up the base camp have to have everything uh, ready and they have to do that obviously under under the cover of darkness so the crew when they arrive everything is uh, ready to go when we're shooting on the glacier everyone's got the crampons strapped onto their boots because otherwise you'll slip and even with the crampons we had a bunch of guys falling and banging themselves up but luckily no major injuries this year what we had to go through to get the zombie polar bear was riding the zombie polar bear into every season of the show for about four seasons. We thought they'd be so excited to do a zombie bear, and uh, and it's kind of like, oh my god, they're serious about doing this fucking zombie bear. Only to have Bernie and the visual effects guys tell us in the nicest possible way, fuck you, we cannot afford a zombie polar bear. This year made perfect sense that you could have one of these things out there, and we really put our, our four feet down, and we said, god damn it, we want a zombie polar bear. We looked at some of the uh, the the beats, the way the polar bear in the, in the the previews that we got, how it spots the guy's way, how it picks someone up and shakes him around, um, and then we we get our uh, our wires in and, and start rehearsing with guys using different different methods to pull someone around and get the the right body shapes and the right energy. Everything's made sure it's super safe first. We test everything over and over again, um, usually with a weight bag, and when we're happy that it's safe to have someone on, we get someone on. We were holding the flaming sword in the jaws of this thing, so the big guy was able to move the head around, which was something for our, our actor on the floor to work against. I've never really worked with this ping pong ball thing and pretend that's a beer and I've had people going, oh, when I come towards you, I'm a bear. No, you're not. <laughs> Your name's Toby.
most of the, the heavy lifting of the sequence. That was all in Wolf Hill Quarry in Belfast. It's one of those things where, you know, when you film something in another location and then you're responsible for finishing that location off somewhere else, you have to really do your homework and try and make sure that you match it as best you can so that then Alan would have an entrance for the characters. When you stand up on the top and look down, it was like we were building, I don't know, an airport or something. The scale of it is enormous. We built nature. <laughs> no, sometimes I walk out there and I think we're crazy people. We had a really tricky time trying to work out what a frozen lake looks like and how we can achieve that. And that went from a compacted quarry floor to putting concrete down to a nice flat finish. And then there had to be hues of color that had to add to that. Then we had to work out how the ice would look, trying to make that look three dimensional and as if it was transparent ice. All these things are really, really tricky. Stop! We paint the cliffs a little bit, and then we snow the cliffs a lot. Three and a half thousand bags of snow through six machines with 15 guys. We're constantly redressing it and, and adding to it, and every day we have to scrape it off and start again the next day. And yeah, it, it's full on. It's a really cool set. Like it's a bit, it's an amazing set. They they cemented a whole quarry to flatten it out to make it look like an ice lake. The amount of workmanship is, is incredible. And it, I mean, it really, we've had to run across that ice. It just looks so real, it's fantastic. I thought it was a real lake. Uh, then I understood that they have made this for this sequence. Yeah, it, it blew my mind. This amount of people, and when, when the camera rolls, everything just sort of comes together at precisely the right time. Original intention was to dig out the areas on location where people would need to fall through the ice. And then it became clear to everyone that probably the, the temperatures were gonna be so terribly cold. We figured out if we use motion control, then we could achieve it on stage. Where the whites fall for the ice, we, we're doing those as separate set pieces and then building rigs to drop underneath the ice to, to take the weight of the actors and then allow them to drop through. You know, even though we've got 10 guys falling in while the camera's moving, by the time we're finished, we've got 100 guys falling in and the camera's moving five times as far. Everyone's always like, oh, you get to shoot in a tank, great. No, it's the end of the season and I get plunged into cold water with a full costume on. It's gonna be miserable. <laughs> When you're in the middle of a fight, you need to have all your adrenaline on a maximum. So I had to be pumped up and ready uh, in five to ten seconds and then calm the fuck down very fast. <laughs> You've got to loosen up. You've got to be ready for a fight. It was a big Norwegian and we we're both looking at you. Ah! 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 Even the extras are so into it. They're all, you're, ah! Ah! <laughs> One of our heroes gets chased to the top of the island. The higher edge is about 11 foot from the, uh, from the frozen lake. Big trust thing, because I'm falling into the guys. The guys are catching me off the end of the rock, opposed to uh, where you'd normally do falls into boxes or an airbag. It's funny how times have changed. In season two, the dragon was riding on Danny's shoulder, and now Danny's riding on the dragon's shoulder. And when Danny gets on and off the dragon, it's sort of like wheeling up the stairs to a 747. We've modeled the dragon and then laser cut this full-scale giant piece of polystyrene to create a section of the dragon's back that is living on the island at the frozen lake. I've got a bit of climbing to do on that contraption with a, a, with a person on my shoulder. I just hope I can do it. Well, I've never flown a dragon before. I'm sure we're fine, just hang on. This year, things are a little bit beefier. We have a bigger motion base, we have a bigger buck. It's a lot harder, especially for Amelia, it's one thing to act in a room with somebody and to draw on this, your considerable resources as an actor. It's another thing to have a situation that's supposed to incorporate the same level of emotion, but 
You're in the most artificial environment you can possibly imagine. It's the opposite of walking in costume through Iceland. You know, the harder the challenge, the more I relish it. But this, this really, you're like, can I just even maybe have like, you know, like a screen with like clouds or something? Like I've never flown on a dragon. And to just harness that power, can you, I mean, can you even imagine? The fire column slice in the ice, we wanted to make sure that it looked like a cutting torch and it's exploding the ice, um, you know, atomizing the ice immediately. So we worked with Sam's team again. And when you see it, you know, it really is awesome. We knew that the Night King would, would see and seize this opportunity and like to think that when the dragon dies that it's kind of a, a nice one-two punch because on the one hand you're just seeing the, the horror of one of these three, the three only unique amazing beings like this in the world uh, going under the water and not coming up again and you're processing that then you're processing something that's even worse which is when it comes back out from under the water again. The eyes of the, of the White Walkers and the Whites have been such a prominent feature of, of the show and a lot of work has gone into the specifics of how the, the eyes look and, uh, and to see that hopefully iconic image at this point blown up to the size of you know a beach ball, uh, that, that seemed like it was an inherently crowd-pleasingly oh shit moment for everybody.